The climax of the 1938 film in Old Chicago was a spectacular portrayal of what the Great Fire might have been like. But these are very real examples of what the deadly and devastating blaze left in its wake. A stack of plates fused together from the intense heat. A little boy's marbles that seemed to be melting like ice cubes. A heap of screws forever forged into one big clump. They are part of the extensive collection of great Chicago fire artifacts housed at the Chicago History Museum. But where many of these historic fragments came from is unknown. Some could very well be items that people fleeing the fire were trying to salvage. Most people had far less time to gather their belongings than they, than they ever imagined. Often a uh, question people get if you know a disaster befell you, what would you grab? Well, for these little girls, it was obvious you got the, you know, Bessie or, or whoever. And so we have four or five of those dolls that little girls carried, you know, through the fire. The museum has hundreds of such artifacts, too many to display. On permanent display are a number of fascinating items. There's the courthouse jail key used to free dozens of prisoners as the fire advanced. Burnt cookies from one of the 152 bakeries destroyed in the fire. And there's even a chunk of wood from Mrs. O'Leary's famous barn, as well as a cowbell allegedly worn by one of her potentially arsonous bovines. The exhibit also separates history from myth by telling what really happened from October 8th to the 10th, 1871. The fire did indeed start in Catherine O'Leary's barn on DeCoven Street, but most probably not like this. A newspaper reporter made up that story, but it didn't stop famed American illustrator Norman Rockwell from creating his own version of the myth with the cow fiendishly eyeing the lantern behind her. The painting hangs at the Chicago History Museum. The real cause of the fire remains unknown. What is fact is that the sprawling ramshackle metropolis of Chicago had a hot and dry summer that year, and with much of the city constructed out of wood, it was a tinderbox waiting to go up in flames. On the morning of the Great Fire, firefighters had finished battling a different blaze that was reported as a disastrous conflagration. The firemen and their horses were reportedly exhausted. The O'Leary fire began around 9 p.m. on Sunday night, and a lookout atop the Chicago courthouse saw it. But he misjudged how far away it was and notified a wrong battalion via a then state-of-the-art telegraph system. And fueling the fire, literally, were the winds. It spread very quickly. There was a wind that was described as a hurricane, as a gale force. It was a pretty stiff wind that um, gathered momentum and then as the fire grew it actually created its own weather and that was the thing that really spread the, the fire because you have this huge amount of heat that's going up into the atmosphere and it's it's super heating the air. In old Chicago gets a few things spectacularly right the speed and intensity at which the fire moved the almost instant destruction it caused and the horrific panic that had many Chicagoans running and driving carriages into Lake Michigan. The fire burned itself out in the early hours of Tuesday, October 10th, and the heart of Chicago was unrecognizable. This was the old Palmer House Hotel before the fire and after. Booksellers Row before and after. And Pine Street looking north toward the untouched water tower before and after. The devastation was almost unfathomable. A swath of Chicago, about three and a half miles square, 12,000 buildings, one third, about 100,000 of Chicago's population were homeless. Um, so it, it really was the central part of Chicago, the, what we call the loop, and south and a little bit west, all the way up to to Fullerton Avenue was, was totally destroyed. The Chicago Tribune was unable to publish for two days. When it finally did, it did so on out-of-town presses. In short order, a list of the missing was published, as well as heartbreaking personal ads looking for loved ones that had not been heard from. 
Much of the debris from the fire was used as landfill and buried right here just east of Michigan Avenue between Randolph and Roosevelt. This was part of Lake Michigan then, but from the tragedy of the fire, Chicago began constructing for itself a new and magnificent front yard that would become Grant Park. But even as the destroyed city was still smoldering, Chicagoans resolved to start anew. The History Museum has a makeshift sign from one of the post-fire entrepreneurs, William Kerfoot. He advertised that he still had his wife, children, and energy, and with that energy, he set up a make-do real estate business, the first in the burnt district, he boasted. What exactly he had to sell is unknown. But perhaps the most touching item in the History Museum's collection is a letter by a 12-year-old boy named Justin, whose family was left homeless by the fire. He wrote to a friend about being burnt out of our house and home, and he tells of escaping with his prized possession. On the back of the letter, he drew a picture of his family fleeing the fire, and he portrays himself bringing up the rear, showing what he was able to save, his beloved pet goat. As Chicago burns in In Old Chicago, Tyrone Power is among those watching from a boat on Lake Michigan. His character was pure fiction, but one of his lines was pure fact. Nothing can lick Chicago. Within four years of the fire, a visitor to the city could hardly tell it had been decimated. Great architects came to Chicago, and within 22 years, the Columbian Exposition dazzled the world. Chicago became the birthplace of the skyscraper and renowned for its architecture. And 140 years after the Great Chicago Fire, the city that was reduced to cinders virtually overnight is more breathtaking than anyone in October 1871 could have imagined. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Eddie Aruza.